I want to say welcome to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Doing something a little new today. Uh, God has put it on my heart to do a series on a Bible study. And so just let's just jump right on in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you come now. And Father, let your will be done. Touch me now, Lord. Use me any way you see fit. Father, I bless that this lesson touch hearts and touch minds, that someone will hear and receive your word, Father, that your word don't return to you void. Father, continue to look in on the sick and the shut in, Father. Bless those that are in bereavement. Bless those first responders, Father. Bless those that are in the hospitals, Father. Father, I just ask you to look in on everyone. Bless our leaders in this land, Father. Keep us in the hollow of your hand as we continue to hold to your unchanging hand. Father, this is my prayer, my plea, and my petition as I come boldly before your throne. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Going to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart because I struggled for years and years with this. And God has placed it on my heart to teach this in order to help someone else. So the title that we're going to be talking about today, Developing a Relationship with God, Part 1. Developing a Relationship with God, Part 1. And there's going to be some reference scriptures involved in this. We will be coming out of the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And then we're going to move down to Genesis, chapter 22, verses 9 through 13. Let me give you an introduction. Might hit some a little hard, but i got to tell you the truth. Because they say the Bible convicts us. And so, I'm going to show you why this was so personal to me when God gave me this lesson. Amen? When I first joined the church, I guess I was around about 9 years old. I had people running up to me, hey, you need to join this, and you need to join that, and I attended church school on a regular basis, and I attended the 11 a.m. worship service, and sometimes I went to a few Bible studies, but to be honest with you, to be honest with you, I only learned church doctrine. You know, Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and he rose on the third day with all power in his hand. And I believe all of that. It's very important that I believe all this. Now, I was taught this, though, at a very young age, and it stayed with me. But as I grew older, it seemed to me that this same message started to become stale. i got to tell you the truth, and I'm going to explain why here in a little bit. Therefore, I became a backslider within the church, just in and out of the church, year after year after year. But one day, something just kept tugging and tugging at my heartstrings, and I made that bold decision to rededicate myself to the Lord and come back to the church. Now, the church was still teaching that same message, which is what the church is supposed to do. But what I found out, what I was missing that they were not teaching me was how to have a personal relationship with Christ. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I believe He is the Son of God. I believe He died for my sins. I know all this. I believe all this. But what I did not know was how to relate to Him on a personal level. You see, I relied on others to teach me this. But there was no one available for me to learn this, both inside and outside of the church. We had folks that were too involved in preparing church programs and people put most of their efforts in their positions in the church or in their ministry. So you see, they did not have time to teach an individual like me on what it should take to have a personal relationship with God. There are so many people out there. They get baptized. They join the church, and then after a few months later, they leave the church. All because no one took an interest in them to help them with their spiritual growth. I know some churches have new members classes, but most of these classes involve church doctrine and church bylaws. So the new member will learn the rules of the church and church doctrine, but some of them would never learn what it is to have the true intimacy of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
It took me a few years to figure this thing out. And I said to myself, you know, I said, Self, you're just going to have to be responsible for yourself. Because I read in my Bible that he blesses those who are diligently seeking his face. So God placed it upon my heart to help those who are struggling on how to relate to God. You know, Christians feel that it is the pastor's job to teach people how to relate to God. That is true, but I'm here to tell you today. It is the job of every Christian, every Christian, to aid and to nourish those who are spiritually weak in Christ. We got to help them. We got to help them. This is why we have so many people out there that don't even know if they are saved or not. They don't even know what it is to have the born again experience. They are babes in Christ. And this is a result of others in the church that is not willing to take the time to help them with their relationship with Christ. I am only going to go over part one today, and there are a few more parts. But I'm going to follow up these teachings in the coming weeks. Part number one is what we're going to talk about tonight. You must realize, you know, if you're trying to have a relationship with God, if you're trying to develop a relationship with God, you must realize that trust goes both ways. And we will be coming out of the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and Genesis 22, verses 1 through 12. Part, part 2, when we get there, you must be willing to serve and have no fear on the unknown. See, once you develop that relationship with God, God is going to call on you to do some things. And guess what? You can't be a chicken if you truly, truly want to have a strong relationship with our Father. And we will be coming out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 8 through 9. And then we will come out of the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. Part 3. This is a real good one. I like this one. Can't wait till we get to it. God will listen to you as long as you are willing to listen to him. And that will be coming out of the book of Genesis again, uh, chapter 18, verses 24 and 33. And then we're going to move over to Exodus, chapter 32, 11 through 13. God will hear you, but you got to first must hear God. You have dialogue. Part four, God will bless your family. You know, if you got a good relationship with God, and there's someone in your family struggling and going the wrong way, if you pray and you found favor in the sight of the Lord, God will help that family member. Some people give up on family members. Oh, they're hopeless. I'm not going to waste no time with them. When you pray to God and turn that person over to God, God can bless your family. And that scripture will be coming out of 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, and then we'll be moving to verses 10 and 12. Part 5. We're going to be talking about your prayer life. We'll work on the behalf of others. I'll say this again. When you dialogue with God, and it's a two-way, God can intercede on your behalf. He will intervene on your behalf. And whoever you're praying for, God will help them. And this is coming from the book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 5 through 18. And our last part, part 6. We're going to be talking about you must be willing to make God your first priority. That's the problem we got. I should have had that one first. But I wanted to ease into this thing to get you to have a better understanding. You must be willing to make God your first priority. And we will be coming from the book of Psalms, chapter 28, verse 14. And then we're going to move over to the book of Psalms, chapter 31, verses 1 to 3. You know what? Let's deal with this first point. My first point today has to deal with trust. And that trust begins with faith. And we all know that without faith, that it is hard to please God. Now, in order to have a relationship with God, we must realize that trust works both ways. And the question is, are you willing to trust God in your life? And can God trust you no matter the assignment or the circumstances? Let's go to scripture and look at a man who trusted God. And later on, we found out that God could trust him. You see, it works both ways. If you want to have a relationship with God, you got to trust him. And in turn, God will be able to trust you. 
So let's go to Genesis, our first reference scriptures. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, look at this trust that this man has in God. they got to be having a relationship. Look at the trust. And don't miss this. I'm going to point these three things out. Leave your family and friends. Go to a destination that I have given you. I haven't even given it you yet. I'm just telling you to go somewhere. I ain't letting you know the exact location, but I want you to go somewhere. And then he says, I want you to do this at an old age. This man is 75 years old. 75 years old. First of all, let's ask ourselves. Why is it that God wants Abram to pack up and leave his family and his homeland? See, first of all, the Bible don't give you everything in detail, so you got to do some in-depth studying. You have to know the history of Abram to figure these things out. And I'm not going to go through everything, so I'm just going to pull out some meat that will get your attention. As a child, Abram had a huge question that was burning in his heart. And that question was, who is God? Who is God? He first thought the sun was God. But when the sun left and the moon came up, he thought that the moon was God. But later on, in his little mind, he figured it out. The sun and the moon wasn't God. Then Abram went to his father, Terah, and he asked his father, Who is God? Who is God? And Terah, who served under King Nimrod, was an idol worshiper. So he took his son into the inner chamber of the court and showed him all of these idols and stated that these were the gods who created all things. Abram believed his father and he brought sacrifices to these idols. So when he rose the next day to see if the, the sacrifices had been consumed and they were still laying there in front of these idols, he was furious, and he began to destroy these idols. Eventually, Abram came to the conclusion that God created the heaven and the earth and everything down there. And he kept these beliefs in his heart and his mind. God knew, God knew, in order for himself and Abram to have a relationship he needed for this man to leave this city and this country that worshiped idols. And when God spoke to Abram, whether we want to believe it or not, Abram knew that he heard the voice of God. So after he received his instructions from God, look at this, y'all. He obeyed. He obeyed and did what God told him to do. That is what we must do also. You see, God will speak to us too in our inner voice. And he will whisper. And you will know if it's from God or not. Because God will not demand that you do evil. But just like Abram, you must trust that God knows what he is doing. And when God tells you to get away from some folks and some things that are not about him or didn't come from him, leave. Leave. Don't question it. Just trust him. Trust that he knows what's best for you. And then if you go on to look, you will see that he said, I'm going to bless you, and from you going to be many nations. Many nations. I'm going to bless you. Oh, that's good news. Now, in order for us to develop a relationship with God, he must be able to trust us. So ask yourself, can God truly trust me to operate in his will and not my own? Can he depend on me to be that Bible that someone else can read? 
Can he trust me to be kind to others? Uh Uh-oh, that's a biggie. Well, why don't we just stay with Abram and see how God came to trust him? Let me give you a little background before we get into scriptures. God had promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child. Of course, they both had some doubts because they both were very old. But true to his word, I'm going to say it again, but true to his word, God blessed them with a son named Isaac. Now, Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old when Isaac was born. Now, as the boy grew older, God called upon Abraham and requested that Abraham give his son Isaac to him as a burnt offering. Did you hear me? You waited all this time, you and your wife, to have a son. But now I want you to offer this young man up to me as a burnt offering. God even chose the place where he wanted the altar to be built. Abraham, once again, trusting God, obeyed and got up early the next morning and started out with Isaac and a couple of men. He told them as they got closer to the location, y'all need to stay right here. Me and the lad, we shall return. Uh Uh-oh, did y'all, don't miss that. I want you to give me your only son as an offering. But now he's telling these other two men, we'll be back. That's trust. As they got closer to where God wanted the altar to be built, of course you know Isaac had some questions about the sacrifice. Dad, I see the wood. Dad, I see the fire. Probably said, Dad, I see the knife. But Dad, where is the sacrifice? And you know, Abraham reassured his son, and he said God would, would provide the sacrifice, son. So let's look at Genesis 22, 9 through 13. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. And bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Brothers and sisters, did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see what kind of faith and trust Abraham had in God? You see, God and Abraham had a true relationship that was not only based on faith in God, it was also based on his previous experiences with the Lord. Let me ask you something. Has there been some things that God has done for you in your life and you just knew it was hopeless and you kept saying, ain't no way, ain't no way, and God intervened and fixed that thing and it just blew your mind? And then you had to realize There is a God. There is a God. Abraham knew that God can do anything and everything but tell a lie. Because if you go back and you read Genesis, he said, from your seed will become many nations. So when he told them two lies, he said, y'all stay here. Me and the boy will be back. He remembered that promise that God made him. And he knew that Isaac, was the only son that him and Sarah had. So it was previous experience, promises, dialogue. He had a relationship with God. See, we got to develop a relationship with God. Go back and remember the things that God has done for you. Look at where you were at and look at where he brought you to. 
And tell me why you still ain't got that relationship with him. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to be involved in your decisions. It hurts God sometimes when you don't want to have a relationship with him. But man, look at this relationship he got with Abraham. See, he knew enough about God that God could be trusted and that God would never fail him. I know some of y'all out there saying, by God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, man, ain't that kind of extreme? But let me tell you something about the God I serve. God would never ask us to do something that he wouldn't be willing to do himself. What are you talking about, teacher? Well, go back. Look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Abraham, you ain't did nothing that I wasn't willing to do. So before I close, I want to add this. Y'all know back in the Old Testament, we know that God spoke directly to the prophets and to those who found favor in his sight. Now, when Jesus left the earth, the Holy Spirit has come down to dwell inside of each and every one of us. And it is that same spirit that speaks to us today. And if you are serious out there, if you are serious out there, I'm going to say it again. If you are serious out there in seeking a relationship with Christ, you must be willing to listen to the spirit and obey his instruction. You know, sometimes you get that little voice in your head and you know something ain't right. That's the spirit. Then you're going to run around and tell somebody, my conscience is bothering me. Okay, whatever you want to call it. But that is God speaking to you. He gives you that spirit of discernment. There's things you can't look at on television that should bother you. If you got a relationship with Christ, there are some words that come out of people's mouth that should bother you when you got that relationship with Christ. Christ was not a hypocrite. He told you in the Bible things you should and shouldn't do. Even in the Old Testament, God gave us the Ten Commandments, which we don't probably broke all of them anyway because we're so disobedient. That's the reason why Jesus had to come and die for us. Because the blood running through your veins couldn't save you. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that came and saved us all. But now we must be willing to accept the sacrifice that was given to us on behalf of Jesus. He didn't have to go to the cross. He didn't have to come down here from heaven. But it was because God wants that relationship with you. It's because God loves you so much. It's because he's so full of grace and mercy. Why do you keep going day after day where you don't want to have a relationship? You don't even want to talk to him. And I ain't talking about waking up in the morning and saying, thank you, Lord. I ain't talking about you blessing your food. I ain't talking about you going to bed and I pray. I'm talking about dialogue. And all them things is good. That means you're giving God some of your attention. I'm talking about dialoguing him throughout your day. And let him know that you know that his presence is near you. Have a relationship with him. Watch how good your day go. Watch how you won't have those restless nights when you're trying to go to sleep. So, we can hear God speaking to us when we read his word. And that is how I began to develop my personal relationship with him. It was in his word. That's how I learned. I'm sorry. I said something at the beginning of this uh, Bible study, but I was telling the truth. And just like Abraham, I was looking. I was looking, but I didn't have nobody to help me to have this relationship that I got with him today. A daily Bible study of his word and a daily prayer life will only strengthen your relationship with God. And the more you trust God's will, in your life, the more God will be able to trust you to do his will. So until next week, this is the first of a six-part series, Developing a Relationship with God. This is Reverend Lewis from the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church saying God bless you 
And always, 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 I strongly urge you, no matter what's going on in your life, trust in the Lord.